Chapter Six of Armand Durand by Rosanna Le Proen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Paul Durand, always industrious and prosperous, was now a rich man. Farms and lands he owned in more than one locality, and a college education for his sons seemed to him a matter of course he was no miser and how else could he spend the very considerable sums that had accumulated in his strong-box despite his frequent purchases of land unless on them to college then the two lads went and their outfits for those days of moderate ideas were considered remarkably fine ones though they would probably have excited the scorn of youths of the present generation armand was tall for his age and slight paul was remarkably developed in height and robustness for his both boys had been for some years under the charge of an efficient village schoolmaster who had at least fairly started them on the thorny road of learning it was in the month of september the very day of the reopening of the classes after the summer's vacation that they entered beneath the low-browed portal of the old montreal college durand accompanied them and after a short conversation with the director of the institution father and sons were standing alone in the square flag-paved entrance hall paul's eyes were glancing restlessly around him from the low time-darkened ceiling to the small paned curtainless windows but armand's look was wistfully fixed on his father who was saying a few words of farewell counsel and encouragement at length the final pressure of hands was given and as durand left the hall the porter a rather unsociable not to say ill-natured looking individual entered paul returned his inquisitive scowl by a glare of defiance and whispered to his brother i hate that fellow like poison already there were no lessons as the classes were not yet formed so a long day was afforded the newcomers to become acquainted with their future abode and fellow pupils paul made good use of his time and before he went to rest that night he had engaged and defeated three different boys in single combat sworn eternal friendship to another invited a fifth to spend the next vacation with him in his father's house in allonville besides selling two knives and a pocket-book at exorbitant prices to some of his comrades whose purses having been recently replenished by kind friends were able to indulge in the luxury of paying a high price for things they did not want armand had made no advance as yet towards intimacy with any of his companions and some of those quick-witted young gentlemen had invested him before twenty-four hours with the title of miss armand whether this feminine appellation of course intended as a highly contemptuous one had been suggested by his retiring quiet manner his shyness or his delicate beauty of feature and complexion it is impossible to say but it was soon almost universally adopted and inflicted an extraordinary amount of mortification on its object the two brothers were sitting together one holiday some weeks later in a room overlooking the playground surrounded by its noble range of towering poplars when the voices of two loiterers who had paused a while underneath the window unconscious of their near proximity arrested their attention yes it is a good knife but i paid a good price for it i bought it from one of the durand boys from the large-boned noisy fellow i'll warrant was the reply there seems nothing of a trading spirit in the younger one i think the younger one a regular milksop a muff a fellow to run from a mouse come we neither of us know anything about his courage we haven't seen it tried yet but he has a thoroughbred look about him which that great hulking brother of his has not got just look at the small hands and feet straight regular features and slight graceful shape as the words were spoken a frown gathered on paul's forehead but he made no remark merely bending more forward to obtain a view of the speakers in which action he was involuntarily imitated by armand 
there they stood talking together one a tall elegant stripling of seventeen named victor de montenay the other rodolphe belfond the owner of the knife a compact square-built swarthy-looking boy somewhat younger don't talk such trash de montenay said belfond angrily what business has a fellow with a face as pretty and hands as small as a girl's as well ask what business has the racer to possess slight graceful limbs and elegant symmetry of form instead of rejoicing in the lumpish shape and movements of the cart-horse i don't see what you are driving at was belfond's retort i suppose in your eyes a fellow can't be of a decent size and build without being compared to a cart-horse because you happen to be a little in the slim and dainty line yourself well my dear rodolphe i am both proud and thankful that i do possess the elegant slimness on which you seem to set such little store if a fortune were placed in one scale and my own personal good points in another i would unhesitatingly choose the latter for you know money might come to one accidentally some day or another but money could never change huge red fists and broad square feet into hands and feet like why should i mince it my own for instance hang it de montenay if you are not a fool you are a fop which is just as bad much good the aristocratic smallness of your extremities as the doctors call them would do you in boxing boating or anything useful it would serve at least good rodolphe to distinguish the captain from the crew the officer from the private i tell you what it is victor de montenay i'd knock you over in a minute did i not know that my family is as good and as old as your own and that consequently in sneering at me you are simply making a donkey of yourself my friend you would indeed be thick-headed as well as big-handed if you thought there was anything personal in my remarks come and have a game of football to put you in good humour with yourself and your friends they've hit us both pretty hard muttered paul between his teeth you a milksop and i a big hulking clod pole i hope i may be able to pay off one of them yet in the peculiar emphasis the speaker laid on the word one he evidently thought only of redressing his own particular wrongs but his companion without any comment on this unbrotherly reticence quietly said what else could we expect listeners seldom hear good of themselves you are a scrupulous fool was the sharp reply i think there is as much nonsense in you as in that conceited idiot who seems to set such store on his good looks i only wish i could get a chance of spoiling them for him a little the noisy entrance of half a dozen comrades put a stop to further discussion and armand seeing his brother's sullen mood still continued amused himself by examining the pile of new study books before him the regular school routine now commenced and as far as the labor of learning was concerned armand had nothing to complain of for he mastered his tasks with an ease and correctness which won him high eulogiums from his teachers unfortunately however this very success excited the envy of some of his companions whilst his shy retiring nature made him no friends day by day his unpopularity increased and the words miss armand milksop were freely applied to him without any provocation on his part all this was intolerable to the boy's sensitive nature and more than once he determined he would write to his father and beg pray him to remove him from college one afternoon that he was standing quietly on the playground looking on at the sports of the others a band of his tormentors gathered around him and with the malicious ingenuity peculiar to many boys began their persecutions one mockingly requested miss armand to join in their games another deprecated such a thing lest she should spoil the beauty of her soft white hands which were only fit to hold on to mamma's apron-string this ancient witticism was received with shouts of applauding laughter 
which grew more hilarious when a third young gentleman expressed his wonder that miss durand should go out without a sunbonnet as her delicate complexion might get tanned or freckled armand's breath came quick and panting his whole being was writhing beneath the pitiless mockery of his tormentors who to do them justice scarcely realized the amount of suffering their thoughtless jesting inflicted on that highly wrought sensitive organization so shrinkingly afraid of ridicule his cheek became pale as death and half imploringly half despairingly he glanced round the circle alas no relenting no compunction betrayed itself in any of the boyish countenances breathing mirth and mischief feeling keenly the cruelty the injustice of a persecution so unmerited on his part the boy burst into tears at sight of this unexpected display of emotion some became silent whilst others only seemed to redouble their persecutions ah she's going to faint quick a smelling bottle said one a pocket handkerchief to wipe her tears suggested another at this juncture the elegant de montenay and his friend and constant companion rodolphe belfond strolled up and joined the group why hello what is the matter with miss armand inquired the latter armand looked suddenly up like a stag at bay and his glance fell on the speaker who loomed up large in front of him supposing in the perturbation of the moment that rodolphe had been among his persecutors from the first and giving way to the wild craving for revenge that had been swelling within his heart for the last few moments armand sprang on his foe with the strength and rage of a tiger bringing him to the earth with him he rolled over and under his antagonist and unmindful of the sledge-hammer blows the latter showered upon him he never relaxed the fierce grasp he had taken of his throat a mist seemed before his sight a dullness in his hearing and he was totally unconscious in that delirium of passion of all other things save thirst of revenge till he was dragged by main force off his antagonist why durand you are a perfect devil you've nearly strangled him said one of the group as he assisted belfond to rise whose blood-stained lips and face livid from partial suffocation presented a somewhat alarming spectacle somewhat confusedly regretting his desperate fury armand mechanically raised his hand to his face and took it down stained with blood without a word he walked over to a tub of water that stood under the rain-spout and commenced washing from his countenance the traces of the fray well friends you'll scarcely call him miss armand any more after this i think questioned de montenay addressing the circle of boys who still stood quiet almost stupefied by the lightning-like rapidity and fury with which the slight delicate boy they had been so ruthlessly tormenting had fallen upon one far exceeding him in size and strength there was no answer to this and addressing himself to belfond he said the best thing you can do is to follow the example of your late adversary who has indeed proved himself a foeman worth your steel and give yourself a good washing it will refresh you as well as improve your appearance belfond with quiet good sense staggered off to follow this advice though not in the direction armand had taken this latter was still at his ablutions when seeing a shadow fall across the sunlight he looked up and perceived de montenay beside him armand do you know that you are a hero he said a brute you mean by no means if it had been that overgrown brother of yours i might have found something brutish in the bulldog tenacity with which you held on strangling and choking your foe but in one of your slight build and strength it was courage pluck in the highest degree give me your hand now armand had entertained from the first a feeling of profound boyish admiration for the handsome young aristocrat before him who always dressed with scrupulous care elegant though often insolent in his manners witty and sarcastic in his remarks belonged to a class with which the country-bred lad had never yet come into contact 
indeed he had looked up to him as something infinitely beyond the reach of his friendship or intimacy under any circumstances and to have him thus standing beside him with words of praise on his lips and proffering the hand of friendship brought a flush of exultant delight to his brow and made his heart beat fast with pleasure shyly however without betraying what he felt he extended his hand saying at the same time but i thought rodolphe belfond was a friend of yours so he is and de montenay seated himself on the edge of the tub whilst armand dried his face and hands in his handkerchief so he is indeed we are distantly related but that is no reason i should fight his battles notwithstanding i spent half the vacations at his place and he the other half at mine that did not prevent my feeling rather satisfied to see him get the worst of the encounter to-day with a youngster like yourself he boasts so much of his bone and muscle his strength and sinew that a lesson such as you gave him will probably prove a wholesome one had armand been older and more experienced in life's ways a suspicion as to the value of such a friendship as victor seemed to extend to his friends might have flashed across him but dazzled by pardonable vanity he listened to his companion as to an oracle without doubt or misgiving you see what's your name armand a good one in keeping with your looks if you had the strength and size the points of a prize-fighter i would have taken no interest in seeing you come out in such style as you did to-day but i must say i was pleased to see you with that girlish face and figure of yours thrash that big massive friend of mine who has knocked myself over more than once don't flush up with such a look of annoyance when i mention your pretty face and figure you will yet be proud enough of them both when you know a little of life yes as proud as i am of mine and he leaned smilingly over his own reflection mirrored back in the humble waters of the tub what do you think the thick-headed louts here my fides Sacatis amongst the rest know what weight beauty either in man or woman carries with it in the world while it lasts armand finding his philosophic young friend becoming rather deep for him hastily replied that he would rather be devoid of such doubtful beauty as procured for him the mockery and persecution of his companions the day will come when you will think otherwise master armand and when the prestige they will gain you will rank far higher in your estimation than even the wondering respect your late exhibition of fearless pluck has won you from your schoolmates the precocious young speaker bent still farther over his water mirror as he spoke and looked more thoughtfully down on the handsome classic face it mirrored back leagues behind his companion in point of worldly knowledge was armand durand for the former had read novels and gleaned from them information that he would have been much better without suddenly rousing himself from his preoccupation he asked what the mischief made you single out so suddenly my big-shouldered friend when some of those other cubs had been tormenting you long before why how astonished you look armand's regret when he learned how comparatively unprovoked had been the fierce assault he had committed on belfond was extreme and his conviction that the part he had played was anything but that of a hero doubled that regret however was speedily overlooked if not forgotten in the mingled gratification and pride found in the thought that the object of his secret boyish reverence had deigned to extend to him the hand of friendship later in the day he found himself unexpectedly in close contact with his late adversary as the boys were preparing to fall into their ranks previous to proceeding to the refectory i say durand whispered the other fiercely as he pointed to his darkened and swollen eye i suppose you are confoundedly proud of your smartness but i'll have my turn next perhaps you would like another bout in the playground to-morrow during recreation frankly no was the honest rejoinder 
and why not pray because you are a great deal stouter and stronger than i am and i would certainly get the worst of it but say armand you bowled him over like a ninepin this morning and perhaps you might do it again said one young gentleman longing for the excitement of a stand-up fight armand shook his head i may have done it once but i wouldn't be able to do it again besides belfond i'm sorry for flying at you in the way i did this morning without sufficient provocation it was some of the fellows who had been worrying me all along that i wanted to attack durand you are as honest as you are plucky shake hands and a second time that day was the hand of friendship extended to armand from that time an intimacy highly gratifying to durand and useful to the elegant victor sprang up between them armand in the simple honest admiration he experienced for the aristocratic air of the de montenays and the gratitude he felt for having been elevated to the coveted post of friend thought no sacrifice too great to offer on the altar of friendship and whether it was writing a thesis copying latin translations for him at the expense of his own play hours or pressing on his gracious acceptance the chief portion of his share of the well-filled basket he and his brother frequently received from home he was equally happy de montenay not only accepted this homage but displayed a marked preference for the society of him who tendered it finding the incense unconsciously offered his vanity very gratifying whilst at the same time he discovered a certain charm in the refinement of word and feeling his boy-friend evidently possessed a refinement arising in great part from the childish innocence and delicacy of his character an innocence so strongly marked that happily for them both de montenay had never yet cared about troubling it the intimacy between victor and rodolphe belfond had latterly almost ceased but as it was the result as much of frequent intercourse between their two families as of mutual preference neither party suffered from its cessation and so with few variations beyond those presented by the duties and amusements of school life the days passed over pleasantly enough till the halcyon time so earnestly longed for by teacher and pupil the summer vacation was at hand with what rapture did both boys leap from the jolting vehicle that conveyed them one bright july morning to their home with what reckless joy did they fling out boxes bags and parcels utterly regardless of accident or injury to the chattels in question and with what exuberant affection did they embrace aunt francoise and shake hands again and again with their father who stalwart erect as ever stood watching them with a feeling of quiet pride he endeavoured somewhat ineffectually to conceal and then what a flood of questions they poured forth regarding barnyard favourites special fruit trees or garden beds whose great attraction lay in being their own interspersed with torrents of disconnected anecdotes about schoolmates school life and masters for long months past the walls of the farmhouse had not heard such voluble chatter such mirthful peals of laughter such snatches of song as they daily re-echoed to now on the return home a course of feasting was of course inaugurated and fruit and cream fresh eggs and butter dainty cakes and preserves presented a charming contrast to the simpler fare of college life never were boys more petted and feasted and never were parents happier in their prerogative of thus indulging them than were paul durand and his sister one sultry afternoon that the lads were lounging in the summer-house arranging rods and tackle for a proposed fishing excursion mrs ratel mending some of the countless torn garments which their wardrobes furnished durand entered and to the question smilingly propounded to him of what news answered i have just seen mr de courval he was about starting for montreal but he intends returning soon and bringing the family with him the family in question consisted not of wife and children for mr de courval had never married but of a widowed sister 
and her daughter whom he had brought from quebec some years previous to preside over his bachelor home when the death of his brother-in-law jules de beauvoir had left them in embarrassed circumstances is mr de courval well asked aunt ratelle yes and he inquired most kindly about our boys he says they intend having gay doings up at the manor house soon and he must see something of them during their vacation neither paul nor armand seemed much elated by this intelligence life offered already too many familiar sources of pleasure to leave them any wish for unknown fields of enjoyment and the member of the group most delighted with the information was certainly mrs ratelle whose secret wish was to see her nephews mingle freely in a more aristocratic sphere than that in which her own lot had been cast some time after a very friendly invitation came from the manor-house for the brothers mentioning they would have the pleasure of meeting some of their schoolmates among the guests paul if he gave the matter a thought at all was rather pleased than otherwise but armand shrank from the idea of going amongst strangers and it required some very sharp words from aunt ratelle to induce him to accompany his brother owing to the unwillingness armand brought to his toilet and the laggard pace at which he walked up to the house it was somewhat past the appointed hour when they arrived and on being shown into the drawing-room they were informed by the polite domestic that mr de courval and his young guests were out in the grounds but would soon be in grateful for a few moments respite armand seated himself in a corner whilst paul strolled leisurely round the room examining its contents what a contrast the apartment presented in its lace and damask curtains mirrors paintings and countless trinkets the very names and uses of which were riddles to them to the plain though clean best room of their own home with its bare floor covered only by a few strips of rag carpet produce of aunt ratelle's industry white dimity curtains simple straw-bottomed chairs and wooden settle its only ornaments being some vividly colored pictures of saints together with a few plaster statuettes of equally amazing untruthfulness to nature the longer armand looked the more deeply he felt how great must be the distance between himself and those who dwelt among the scenes of elegance he now surveyed and the greater became his dread of encountering them so suddenly as to make him start a door at the far end of the room unclosed and a slight elegantly dressed girl of fourteen or fifteen entered she evinced no surprise on seeing the newcomers but after leisurely surveying them inquired if they wanted mr de courval armand made no reply but paul bluntly rejoined i suppose so as he invited us here my name is paul durand and that is my brother armand a quick earnest look shot from the large hazel eyes beneath which armand colored scarlet and again she spoke but this time more courteously my uncle will be here in a few moments and will of course be glad to see you as she left the room paul grumbled nice enough but i hate girls they are always so nonsensical and stuck up armand maintained there was nothing unpleasant about this specimen at least of the sex thus sweepingly condemned ah here they are he hastily added as the sound of voices and laughter floated through the open window in they came mr de courval in front and kindly shaking hands with the newcomers he said you will meet some of your friends here there are two or three from the same college as yourselves armand cast a quick nervous glance on the group of young people surrounding his host finding to his great discomfiture that all eyes were bent on himself and brother but a sentiment of relief descended on his troubled spirits when he perceived victor de montenay among them shyly though quickly advancing towards him he extended his hand to the admired loved friend of his college life but the latter affecting not to see the action with a slight nod and careless how are you durand turned away 
to describe what armand felt at that moment would be impossible shame mortification and wounded feeling were all torturing him at once his misery deepened by the fixed inquisitive gaze of the many strange eyes bent on him when suddenly a pleasant familiar voice heartily exclaimed how are you armand so glad to see you and the hand that had been disdained by de montenay was energetically shaken by rodolphe belfond the latter's frank manliness of character thus happily softened a little the bitterness of the first life lesson given to armand durand a moment after de montenay had disdainfully turned from his college friend he approached the same young lady who had accosted the two brothers a few minutes previous and whom they now knew for the first time was gertrude de beauvoir mr de courval's niece he bent down whispering friendly or flattering words in her ear which she being as wayward and uncertain in temper as she was fascinating in appearance answered by petulantly turning from him and flinging a sprig of heliotrope which she had given her a few minutes previously out of the window the evening with music round games strolls on the lawn passed pleasantly to all of the guests except perhaps our hero even paul having met with a couple of kindred spirits who hated reading girls music and all that sort of trash and cared for nothing but football boating and fishing amused himself tolerably well armand alone too shy and painfully ill at ease to make advances and still smarting from the sharp wound so ruthlessly inflicted by de montenay on every feeling of his better nature counted each hour wearily longing for the end mr de courval though a kind was not a very attentive host and his sister madame de beauvoir who imposing in silks and laces reclined languidly on the sofa during the greater part of the evening still more indifferent than himself isolated and unnoticed armand stole from the drawing-room where he seemed entirely out of place and was standing on the veranda revolving in the quiet moonlight thoughts more painful than pleasant to judge by the expression of his face when a light quick footstep approached and hastily turning he saw gertrude de beauvoir at his side why do you not come in and take some supper she asked all the ices and strawberries will be finished for you young college gentlemen have good appetites thank you i'm not hungry perhaps you are sulky then mamma says boys are always either the one or the other but i am neither miss de beauvoir well all evening you have been so dull and lonely is it because victor de montenay would not shake hands with you armand's brow flushed at the remembrance of that supreme mortification and at the thought that she had witnessed it and he answered yes i was much pained by it especially as de montenay and myself were very good friends at college in your place i would never look at or speak to him again was the impetuous young lady's comment it was very paltry of cousin victor to act in such a manner greatly comforted by this unexpected sympathy the shy reserve of armand's demeanour began insensibly to soften and he soon found himself relating to a willing and engrossed listener details of his school trials and troubles even to the memorable schoolboy skirmish which had been the origin of the friendship between himself and de montenay whilst lightly apologetically touching on the paroxysm of rage to which he had yielded on that occasion gertrude interrupted him by clapping her hands and energetically exclaiming good good you should have served all the wretches in the same way tis fortunate i am not a boy for as i cannot bear a rude word or look patiently i would have been eternally engaged in quarrels with my schoolmates i never begin but at the same time i never put up with any impertinence or injustice at this moment de montenay stepped out of the french window opening on the veranda and saying come miss truant mamma has sent me to bring you to her 
threw his arm carelessly round her waist and endeavoured to draw her towards the house the spirited young lady highly resenting this liberty suddenly turned on him and administering a sounding slap on his ear exclaimed how dare you do that victor de montenay do i ever permit you to take such liberties if de montenay had wished to astonish armand by displaying a greater degree of familiarity with the fair young lady of the manor-house than was in reality accorded him he was certainly well punished turning pale with anger he muttered it seems to me a cousin has a right to so small a privilege i do not contest the small value of the privilege sir answered the pretty termagant tapping her little foot on the ground what i find fault with is your rudeness which your quality of cousin in no manner excuses and indeed our cousinship fourth or fifth degree is so very distant as to be almost doubtful tis a distinction i do not at all covet well i will leave you miss de beauvoir he retorted with ironical politeness perhaps you may wish for an opportunity to give your new acquaintance mr durand the privilege you see fit to deny me and with a sneer on his handsome face he turned away since the beginning of her interview with armand no tinge of colour had once deepened on gertrude's cheek whilst his had been in a chronic state of fluctuation but it was her turn at last and now a vivid flush suddenly overspread her cheek and brow whilst embarrassment kept her silent for a moment suddenly turning sharply on him she said armand durand if i thought you were such an idiot as to believe that de montenay's impertinence i would treat you just as i have done him but whatever other faults you may possess you certainly have not his matchless conceit armand was too much confused to answer but there was nothing painful in his present embarrassment and as he stood there under the soft summer sky the rich odours of the flowers stealing up around them listening but scarcely daring to look at the bright though wayward young creature at his side the scene impressed itself pleasantly on his memory to be recalled with strange yearning in future years when they both should be far apart through force of circumstances more than actual distance come now she quickly said i will introduce you to mamma you must not leave without that for it would be impolite to do so tis no use hesitating she authoritatively added as armand muttering some confused apology drew back come this minute and she lightly led the way her companion unwillingly following in her wake mrs de beauvoir reclining on the sofa with cushions on her right and cushions on her left was talking in an indolent caressing sort of way with de montenay who half knelt in one of the graceful positions that seemed natural to him on a low stool beside her loftily disregardful of his presence gertrude tranquilly said mamma i wish to introduce to you armand durand mrs de beauvoir favoured the luckless candidate for the honour of her acquaintance with a steady stare a cold bow and then immediately returned to her engrossing conversation with de montenay armand hastily retreated from her ungenial presence and then mrs de beauvoir calmly said gertrude my child victor has been asking me to make his peace with you he thinks you are rather severe with him and i must add i think so too too severe with him an old friend and too familiar with new acquaintances who to make things worse are obscure nobodies gertrude silently looked from her mother to de montenay the eyes of the latter were cast down as if he felt pained by the censure thus pronounced on herself but the girl detected a faint gleam of exultation on his features and she coldly retorted as far as regards obscure nobodies mamma they are uncle's guests and as such have a right to be treated with courtesy especially when they know how to behave themselves 
which some of our highly favored acquaintances do not seem to do mrs de beauvoir raised her eyes in gentle deprecation my dear gertrude how often must i implore of you to moderate your natural vehemence of character tis in such bad taste so unfeminine positively vulgar what must what can victor think of you i care very little about his opinion was the scornful rejoinder he can scarcely think less of me than i do of him and i will add just by way of conclusion that if ever he provokes me again as he did to-night i will give him two slaps instead of one with this parthian shot miss gertrude abruptly turned away and bent her steps to the farthest end of the apartment mrs de beauvoir shrugged her shoulders you will require patience my dear de montenay if your intentions remain unchanged but time unceasing watchfulness on my part not to speak of the all-powerful influence of a mother's example will in all likelihood tone down her present peculiarities she is at least truthful and frank yes painfully so madame but n'importe handsome clever graceful she is a prize worth waiting for and i will wait the resolution of a boy of eighteen i fear de montenay and the lady lightly tapped his shoulder with her fan we shall see madame de beauvoir you know i am very determined indeed obstinate in character and will not easily abandon what i once set my heart on as to the petulance with which she treats me it does not annoy me much for i would scorn a prize too easily won in three years gertrude will be eighteen and i will be of age yes and master of an independent fortune thought the wily mrs de beauvoir an excellent parti in every respect for my wilful child End of chapter 6chapter seven of armand durand by rosanna le proen this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary the vacation was over and the boys full of intoxicating recollections of holiday pleasures and liberty had to settle down as best they could to the monotonous routine of college life armand who had begun to love learning for its own sake and to find a new and marked pleasure in the prosecution of studies which he had at first looked on with dislike and apprehension was very contentedly sorting his books and writing materials preparatory to placing them in his desk paul seated beside him was occupied in the same duty but performing it in a very different spirit snatching the books violently from the box then hurling them down ruthlessly on the floor apostrophizing each as a personal and much hated foe ah sacre latin grammar he said frantically clutching at a primly bound volume how many pensums how many headaches and hours of torture are you going to earn for me this year then the offending book was flung some yards off overturning in its flight a comrade's ink bottle which accident resulted in a smart interchange of sentiments anything but complimentary or courteous a moment after de montenay sauntered up oh how are you armand awful isn't it to be back again in these dismal dingy quarters but you don't look half as miserable as some of us armand started and coloured as his late boy hero accosted him but the scene at mr de courval's rose up before him with all its mortifying recollections and he quietly replied that he was quite satisfied to resume his books again pray don't be coming the good boy over us laughed de montenay misinterpreting armand's reserve and never dreaming that his influence over him was irrevocably at an end come instead like a good fellow and see if you can beg or borrow from any one a key to fit my trunk i've lost mine and feel too wretched to look for it i'm sorry to refuse you de montenay but i cannot leave my own books lying about 
i must put them away before the bell rings victor silently stared at the speaker what his fag his follower his worshipper had thrown off his allegiance and now rejected his overtures it was both humiliating and mortifying why what the deuce is the matter with you he angrily asked you are standing mightily on your dignity to-day just as you stood on yours the last night we saw you at mr de courval's when you were too fine to shake hands with my brother savagely put in paul moved not so much by sympathy for armand as by the ill-tempered mood of the moment as well as his dislike towards de montenay who spoke to you blockhead ejaculated the latter darting a look of withering scorn on this new adversary paul glanced regretfully at a ponderous dictionary he had just flung beyond his reach but another tolerably large volume was at hand which he promptly hurled at the enemy's head merely grazing it however de montenay quickly returned the compliment with a thickly framed slate the shock of whose descent paul warded off from his skull by receiving it on his arm furious he started to his feet and a more serious breach of the peace was imminent for de montenay was as ready for the fray as himself when a friendly mediator appeared on the scene in the shape of rodolphe belfond hold on you fellows hold on he good-naturedly interposed because we are all savage at being nailed down again to our desks tis no reason we should bring one another you've lost your key victor here is my bunch try them de montenay without either look or word of thanks took them and sullenly withdrew whilst paul went on with his work in a more angry mood than ever belfond seated himself beside armand saying you served friend victor nicely just now he certainly deserved nothing better but how have you enjoyed your holidays this was the introduction to a pleasant talk that filled up the time till the hour for other duties arrived and armand separated from his companion convinced that if he had lost one friend he had gained another our hero's progress was now very rapid but that was owing as much to great natural quickness as to application for there was a dreamy vein in the boy's character that often filled his mind with other thoughts than the studies over which he bent longer than he would have avowed to any one he brooded and grieved over the painful termination to his pleasant friendship with victor de montenay recalling again and again the galling feeling of humiliation that had almost suffocated him when slighted so painfully by his college friend in mr de courval's drawing-room then he would chafe at social distinctions which seemed so unjust and resolve that in some coming day he would carve his way to a position as high as could be won even if he struggled a lifetime to attain it visions too of the wayward but graceful girl so different to the commonplace respectable wives and daughters of alonville the only specimens of their sex he had as yet seen would flit across his mind and childish innocent as these remembrances always were they somehow or other invariably increased the restless ambitious longings taking deep root in his heart would he turn out a worker or a dreamer time alone could tell but the elements and capacities of both lurked in his nature fortunately for him however the wish to excel supported by the ease with which he acquired his tasks for the present decided the question in the most favourable manner paul blundered on shirking work whenever it was possible to do so and evidently thinking every task or lesson thus evaded a positive gain yet he was not a noted dunce either for natural shrewdness and the attention of vigilant professors made him acquire despite himself as it were a tolerably fair share of knowledge on the further college career of armand we cannot afford to linger for the more eventful chapters of manhood have to be recounted at the end of two years belfond and de montenay left having gone through the course with pretty fair success the coolness between the latter and armand had never passed away but there had been no open hostilities on either side 
belfond however was excellent friends with our hero to the last and made him ever the recipient of the countless plans and hopes he was forming for the happy period when he should bid a final farewell to the college walls and return to that happy home where only son among five sisters he was a household idol after his departure and that of de montenay armand applied himself if possible more closely to his studies than ever and on the solemn public distribution of crowns and prizes which marked the close of the scholastic year as well as of his own collegiate life carried off before the proud happy gaze of his father and of his aunt ratelle the highest honors of the day there were other witnesses of his triumph also and in one of the front seats amongst the elite of the city who were there present sat gertrude de beauvoir and her mother mr de courval on one side and victor de montenay on the other fortunately perhaps for armand's self-possession he did not perceive the latter group till after the close of the magnificent valedictory which he delivered with an eloquence of voice and gesture whose influence combined with that of his refined and striking personal beauty procured him round after round of deafening applause on resuming his seat he looked for the first time in the direction in which they sat and encountered the splendid eyes of gertrude fixed upon him despite the great changes the few past years had made in her transforming the careless self-willed girl of fifteen into an elegant aristocratic girl he knew her at once and his heart beat with a strangely pleasurable feeling on reading in her gaze an unmistakable admiration of the eloquent address he had just concluded mr de courval's face also reflected a similar feeling but mrs de beauvoir was superbly indifferent and de montenay stooping towards her with a slightly satirical smile on his handsome face was evidently indulging in some sarcastic witticism to which she approvingly listened what a splendid young fellow warmly ejaculated mr de courval turning towards his companions how proud his father as well as we allonville people ought to feel of him such eloquence and graceful gesture and then the many honors he has won a qui bono responded de montenay slightly shrugging his shoulders there may be similarity of title but there is no farther analogy between greek and latin roots and those of field and garden will a knowledge of the classics help in raising clover or will versification teach him how to prevent the ravages of the weevil but i don't see why he should return to roots or crops either interrupted mr de courval somewhat testily paul durand has ample means and i doubt not judgment enough to give a lad of such rare abilities a profession the other brother can take the father's place on the farm but i must go up and congratulate my good old friend on his son's triumphs are you coming sister julie really you must excuse me i know nothing whatever of those people and the weather is too hot for making new acquaintances or for renewing old ones that a person would rather forget added de montenay uncle i will gladly accompany you for i not only know those people but like them and shaking out her voluminous muslin flounces gertrude swept past de montenay without vouchsafing him a look the young man's brow darkened as he watched her making her way amid smiles and nods from surrounding friends to the spot where stood the happy family group of which armand was the centre a word or two nothing more to him a friendly grasp of the hand to his father and some confidential chit-chat with tante francoise whilst mr de courval warmly felicitated durand and invited his sons to visit him often either in town or country for he possessed very comfortable quarters in montreal which he patronized with his household during the long winter months this was all that passed still it was enough to excite de montenay's anger and eyeing the little circle he wrathfully exclaimed 
as wilful and wayward as ever each day that adds to her charms seems to increase in equal degree her self-will and interminable caprices like every young and pretty girl she knows her own value replied mrs de beauvoir disguising a yawn for such passages at arms were so frequent between her daughter and young de montenay that her patience at times gave way under their constant repetition i fear so much so mrs de beauvoir that she will never be able to understand the value of a husband's authority his companion opened her eyes to their fullest extent then compassionately said but do you not know my dear de montenay that husbands really have no authority in our rank in life or in the times we live in the wilds of africa polynesia or in places equally remote and uncivilized they may have but believe me nowhere else de montenay smiled grimly a pleasant prospect for a fellow seriously contemplating a plunge into matrimony but why take the plunge if you dread it poor victor i really fear at times that yourself and my wayward girl will not be very happy together tis too late to think of that now too late to retract he muttered for years past i have determined she should be my wife placed my hopes heart and wishes on it i cannot afford to give up my dream now even though it should bring me misery probably the astute mrs de beauvoir was aware of this or she would not have ventured to play fast and loose with so valuable a prize and having studied victor de montenay's character thoroughly knew that a little seeming indifference would advance her favourite project far more than too much apparent eagerness some time after de montenay had left college he had formally asked gertrude's hand and she flattered by the attentions of a handsome suitor who was in his turn sought by half of the girls of her own age and influenced too by the counsels and arguments of her mother who singularly appreciated the wealth and social position of this aspirant to her daughter's hand inclined to his suit an engagement was entered into which was merely a prelude to a series of engagements of a less amicable nature in which gertrude's wayward independence of character and her betrothed's arbitrary jealousy were freely displayed at the close of one of these skirmishes gertrude suddenly changing from a fit of passionate sobbing into a marble calmness of demeanour informed her startled listeners mrs de beauvoir and victor that the engagement was broken off and that henceforth she would consider herself as free as if it had never existed in vain de montenay who was really deeply attached to her begged forgiveness in vain mrs de beauvoir alarmed at the danger of losing so good a parti remonstrated and scolded the young lady was inexorable finally more in sympathy for her mother's tears mrs de beauvoir could nearly always summon the latter at command than her lover's solicitations she consented to a sort of conditional engagement which merely provided that if neither of them changed their minds before the end of the year the marriage should take place but in the meantime both parties should be perfectly free to act as they liked after this matters went on a little more smoothly between the young people he was less exacting she in consequence less exasperating wherever gertrude was de montenay was also and he followed her like her shadow their union at a later period was a generally received thing among the circle in which they moved and de montenay without scruple proclaimed it everywhere as a settled fact judging such a step would prove a very effectual means of keeping other suitors from entering the lists End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of Armand Durand by Rosanna Le Proen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. A happy man was Paul Durand when, installed once more in his comfortable home, he sat with pipe and tobacco before him, 
his fine manly son seated on either side smiling aunt ratelle already engaged in repairing their dilapidated wardrobes whilst he listened to the cheerful animated discussion going on so you are determined paul he said after listening to a violent diatribe from his youngest son against college life followed by an equally energetic eulogium of the happiness of a farmer's destiny so you are determined you will not return to college to complete the course unless compelled to do so you want to enter on a farmer's life at once yes father that is the free pleasant life for me no moping oneself to death in dingy office dungeons studying the learned professions no daubing my fingers with ink and stultifying my brains with thesis writing and note-taking for shame paul deprecated mrs ratelle you should not talk so after costing so much money at college and spending so long there you should have picked up by this time a little love for books and learning books almost shouted paul oh i've had enough of them to last my lifetime i don't think i'll ever open one again not at least till i am grey-headed and happen to be named school commissioner or church warden durand tranquilly smoked on these sentiments notwithstanding the considerable sums spent on the education on which the speaker evidently set such small store in no manner displeased him he had always secretly wished that one of his boys should succeed him in the old homestead and in the management of the large and well-kept farm of whose flourishing condition he was so justly proud the robust and stalwart paul was the one best suited by strength and tastes for the position well dieu merci interrupted mrs ratelle with an indignant jerk of her thread that both my nephews are not of the same way of thinking armand appreciates at least the advantages of education oh armand retorted paul sarcastically he is a genius or a bookworm whichever you choose i think one of them in a family is quite enough armand good-humouredly smiled but aunt francoise severely rejoined one of them is about as much as destiny seems to intend favouring our family with my young nephew for you certainly have no calling that way armand what do your thoughts point to interposed Durand well i suppose first to what paul would call a dingy office dungeon there i can dust the desks and stools while waiting to become judge or attorney-general you need not laugh armand in saying it gravely remarked mrs ratelle some of canada's greatest men have been sons of farmers and i think your chance is as good as another's thank god natural talent and steadiness often meet even in this wicked world with their just reward but i must see now to making some nice hot cakes for your suppers boys which farmer or judge you will equally enjoy that autumn saw armand installed in the office of joseph la Haise, an eminent lawyer of montreal a kind-hearted and benevolent man whilst paul rejoicing in his new freedom from college thraldom rose with the dawn each morning and shared his father's farm duties with a zest and enjoyment that greatly pleased the latter gun and fishing-rod were not neglected either and when durand sometimes saw him return after a half-day's keen sport and watched his athletic frame full of robust health evincing such capacities for keen enjoyment of life he thought with a sigh of his other son toiling over wearisome books in a close gloomy office and almost wished that armand had chosen otherwise let us see how fared it with the latter mr la Haise, the lawyer with whom he studied was kind the study of law itself though dry was not exactly distasteful to him and his father liberal and indulgent gave him money enough to amply supply his wants which were in reality reasonable and moderate he lived with a respectable though humble family where no other boarders were taken and where the meals were comfortable and abundant the linen unexceptionable and mrs martel the hostess motherly and good-natured 
surely life was opening very easily and pleasantly for both brothers could it be that in those bright sunshiny waters there were already at least for one of them breakers ahead mrs martel had neither sister nor daughter to aid in dusting the quaint little delf ornaments decorating her mantelpiece nor in watering and clipping the geraniums and monthly roses that blossomed so luxuriantly in her bright but small-paned windows one afternoon however that armand returned to his boarding-house some weeks after he had taken up his residence there he perceived in passing through the front room to his own apartment a young girl seated near the window sewing she did not even raise her head when he entered and all he saw in the momentary glance he cast upon her was that she had a graceful figure and was exceedingly well dressed at supper however she was seated at table and mrs martel briefly introduced her as my cousin delima lorrain who is coming to stop here for a few days to help me with my sewing armand carelessly looked at her her features were delicately chiselled her jetty hair and eyes superb whilst her figure of slight but perfect symmetry was shown to all possible advantage by an elegance of dress more surprising in one of her station than even her great loveliness still when the meal was over he felt no wish to linger and betook himself without any mental effort to his little room and the dry society of potier and other legal luminaries several weeks had now elapsed and still de lima remained with mrs martel but she was always busy with sewing and as quiet and unobtrusive as it was possible to be notwithstanding her great beauty her refined appearance and timid gentleness of manner armand gave her but a very small share of his thoughts probably because he had first met gertrude de beauvoir and she with her patrician grace and wayward fascinations had become unconsciously to himself the standard by which he judged all feminine attractions the reception of an invitation to an evening party at mr de courval's he little suspected the sturdy argument that had preceded the writing of it between his intended host and mrs de beauvoir filled him with mingled feelings of gratification and embarrassment after a struggle with his shyness he determined on going and lost no time in ordering from a competent tradesman whatever he might require for so important an occasion the evening at times as much dreaded as desired arrived and with a beating heart our hero entered for the first time a ballroom how bewildering the lights music and gaily dressed figures circling round in the dance at first appeared to him but after a time he grew more self-possessed and summoned courage to make his bow to mrs de beauvoir as gorgeous in costly raiment she reclined in a graceful position on a couch smiling on all with easy affability but giving herself very little trouble beyond that to entertain her guests her reception of young durand though cold was polite a circumstance due probably to a threat of gertrude's who hearing her mother declare she would receive this country protege of mr de courval's in a manner that would effectually prevent his returning a second time had therewith announced her intention of making amends for whatever slights or rudeness she should show him by flirting with the victim all the evening with this threat before her and the certainty of its being put in execution if provocation were given mrs de beauvoir we have said received her unwelcome guest civilly enough a few hearty words from mr de courval a smiling kindly bow from gertrude who doubly attractive in her light airy ball dress stood the unembarrassed centre of a circle of admirers and armand glided with a feeling of intense relief into a quiet corner near a side door nothing will induce me to leave this haven of refuge unless to make my escape into the passage if too hard pressed he mentally resolved as he took in all the advantages of his new position 
he farther proceeded to strengthen it by drawing towards him a small table piled with prints and illustrations in which to conceal his confusion if anything should occur to make it overpowering why how are you armand suddenly exclaimed a friendly voice at his elbow where have you been burrowing of late that i've never met you in mr la haise's office in st vincent street not a bad place either taken all in all of course as you have by this time made up your mind to be either a judge or a statesman you must begin by the first step towards it well you'll do you are steady and you have brains two most important points in the career you have chosen and for the matter of that in any other and yourself belfond why i've almost gone through the professions i tried the law first oh it was intolerable dry dusty and barren then i had a shy at medicine but though i could stand the horrors of the dissecting room and body stealing i could not no for the life of me i could not endure the smell of the drugs a notary's bondage i have not tried for i have had enough of the law in every shape but there is time enough to make up my mind besides as my old bachelor uncle and godfather toussaint l'allemand has lately declared his intention of formally making me his heir provided i cut all useful or honest occupations such being in his opinion somewhat derogatory to a gentleman's dignity i will probably end by being nothing at all you will be able to do so if mr lelemont possesses half the wealth rumour credits him with true still i should like to try for a while an artist's career at least the travelling and sight-seeing part of it but i suppose uncle toussaint wouldn't hear of such a thing i say though you don't intend stopping here all night tis a capital corner with a nice cool draught but you have no right to monopolize it entirely ah miss gertrude is looking this way i suppose she will soon be bearing down on us how do you like her really i know her very little rejoined armand somewhat flurried by this abrupt questioning but she is very elegant and fascinating so do i not think she is clever and good-looking enough but with a terrible will of her own i have five sisters and i do not think i have seen as much temper and caprice exhibited between all of them since i left off pinafores as i have witnessed miss de beauvoir display on two or three different occasions but perhaps the fault lies more in the manner that odious mother of hers has brought her up than in herself in justice to the young lady thus censured belfond should have stated that his sisters were phlegmatic easy-tempered girls somewhat inclined to be stout and of a very different organization to the impulsive sensitive gertrude moreover they were happy in the rule of a mother who was as wise as she was devoted very gracefully miss de beauvoir floated up to the two young men and after a few words of friendly greeting to armand with whom she now spoke for the first time since his entrance playfully chided them for wasting so many words and moments on each other when there were young ladies present to whom they could devote both do you dance mr durand armand replied in the negative and belfond sauntered off saying that as he did so in a sort of a way he would now look up a partner miss de beauvoir remained some time longer chatting with her enraptured companion who the first few moments of intense embarrassment over felt much more at ease than he could have believed possible ten minutes previous the fact was though the young girl could be sarcastic and arrogant to a most disagreeable extent when provoked there was a frankness a natural simplicity about her that inspired confidence instead of repelling it probably finding her daughter's interview with armand too protracted mrs de beauvoir came up after a time politely inquiring why mr durand did not join the dancers i do not know how to dance madame rejoined armand 
relapsing into the state of confusion from which she had just emerged would he favor them with a song then again our hero protested his ignorance mentally thanking heaven he was able with a clear conscience to do so well you must take a hand at cards they want a player in the next room and she carried off the reluctant armand triumphing in having separated him so diplomatically from his fair companion he was soon seated at a whist table with belfond's eldest sister for his partner and she good-naturedly overlooked his many blunders never once reproaching him for trumping her tricks and resolutely ignoring her lead this forbearance he felt the more grateful for as the sharp-looking lady on his right mercilessly pounced upon her hapless partner a quiet middle-aged gentleman in spectacles every time he infringed in the slightest manner the most trifling rules of the game music and singing there was plenty of and gertrude and de montenay sang a couple of duets splendidly together both evidently quite indifferent to the applause they elicited then there were a couple of wretchedly bungled opera selections a good song from belfond who grumbled sotto voce oh bother on being asked to sing and a splendidly served supper there were no social round games so common then no forfeits or anything of that sort mrs de beauvoir being too fashionable to tolerate them yet on the whole the party went off pleasantly enough and armand who had enjoyed another long delightful talk with miss de beauvoir returned home quite charmed with his debut in gay life the timid advances he found himself forced to make to some of the ladies present were most graciously received for though he neither sang danced nor flirted his handsome face and refined appearance won him smiles and courteous looks on all sides end of chapter eight chapter nine of armand durand by rosanna le Proin. this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary the next day belfond called to see him and they had an hour's pleasant talk in the neat little room which despite its rag carpet whitewashed walls and country-made chairs was very comfortable a couple of pretty bright-coloured mats and a daintily fashioned pen-wiper evidently the work of feminine fingers were on the little table and the visitor took them up saying my sister eliza has just given me some trifles like these how do you come to have any you have no sister or cousin have you none now that i think of it this is the first time that i've seen these dainty nothings here surely your fat motherly hostess has something else to do than pass her time in preparing romantic surprises for you in the shape of ornamental needlework queried belfond amused by his own conjecture it can scarcely be her it must be miss de lima lorrain a cousin of hers who is staying here just now helping with the house sewing oh we are coming to it at last friend armand though in a roundabout sort of way laughed belfond now i'll wager what you will that the maker of these mats is young and pretty i believe she's both though i've scarcely looked at or spoken to her ten times since she has been in the house answered armand with a slight shade of weariness in his tones for he looked on the matter as too uninteresting even for jesting belfond with well-bred tact abandoned the subject seeing it was distasteful and spoke of past college life politics and whatever other topic presented itself after a time he approached a window overlooking the little garden which despite the brilliant colouring of october foliage appeared bleak enough suddenly he uttered a low whistle of astonishment and eagerly exclaimed tell me armand who is that fairy princess that angel in the alley there i never saw such a lovely face that is the cousin miss de lima well you are either a very sly or a very obtuse sort of fellow and belfond turned a sharp scrutinizing glance upon his companion why that girl is absolutely beautiful 
and her carriage and dress as graceful as those of any of the womankind at mr de courval's the other night not excepting the peerless gertrude herself pshaw laughed armand you are bent on making discoveries to-day in whose correctness however no one will coincide belfond eyed him still more closely if i were speaking he said to de montenay or some others that i know i would unhesitatingly assert that all this indifference of yours was sham but i have always found you so straightforward that i really believe in your astonishing blindness but she is coming nearer heavens what a beauty how is it armand that you have not fallen in love with her i am three-quarters gone already then you need fear no rival in me was the gay reply i do not intend sacrificing one moment of the time belonging to those dry shelves and he pointed to a small bookcase filled chiefly with law books to all miss de lima's charms but are you going yes i've been here more than an hour come and take a turn with me in town we'll be just in time to join the usual band of plein airs armand was soon ready and as the two young men passed through the little passage on their way out they met the pretty de lima entering from the garden durand was passing her as usual with a courteous bow when she timidly stopped him to say that a parcel and letter from the country had just arrived for him and if he wished it she would give them to him at once yes yes armand there's no hurry for our stroll look at parcel and letter you must long to know how they all are at home perhaps the gentleman had better sit down in here for a moment and as she spoke the young girl led the way into the little drawing-room on a table near the geraniums was a pile of calico and cotton with a small mat in process of fabrication like those adorning armand's room leaving little doubt as to the donor belfond got up on a pretence of examining the window plants and of inhaling their fragrance but in reality he kept a close watch on delima as she gave his friend the package and handed him her tiny scissors to sever the cords without waiting to give more than a passing glance to the contents which consisted apparently of wearing apparel he broke the seal of the letter and ran over it good news they are all well how is paul questioned belfond couldn't be better he says he pities me profoundly and thinks if he were in my place he would run away at once but i'm all ready now thank you he politely but carelessly added as delima offered to have his possessions put immediately in his own room i'll see to it myself when i return and he and belfond went out together i have just made another discovery said the latter in a graver tone than he had yet employed yes well friend rodolphe you are in a lucky vein this morning tell it please it is this though you don't seem to care about that lovely little girl she certainly cares a good deal about you this supposition both surprised and startled armand and his face flushed nothing of the sort he hastily rejoined as i have already told you we have scarcely exchanged a dozen words together that may be but i do not think my opinion the less correct in consequence i was looking at her instead of the geraniums all the time and she certainly is not as granite-hearted as yourself but i see you would rather change the subject so now for a saunter down notre dame street that evening as armand took his seat at the tea-table he looked for the first time with interest at de lima a natural result of the extravagant praises bestowed on her by his friend as well as of the hints thrown out regarding her partiality for himself she was in her usual place presiding over a smoking dish of some palatable ragout for the martels like many canadian families partook of meat three times a day she never raised her eyes when he entered and as mrs martel was busy with her tray and her husband with cutting the substantial brown loaf gracing his corner of the board armand had ample opportunity of studying her face unobserved was she really as beautiful as belfond had said 
he looked closely at the small regular features the long silken lashes the delicately cut oval face and inwardly acknowledged with something like surprise at his own blindness that she was suddenly she raised her eyes to his proffering some of the contents of the dish before her but meeting his earnest gaze her own drooped and a soft flush overspread her cheek remembering belfond's second discovery which this embarrassment served in some degree to corroborate a feeling of natural vanity mingled with the interest her beauty excited in armand's breast but on mrs martel's asking if the news he had received from home had been favourable his thoughts instantly reverted to the family circle there and delima was for the time forgotten for some time after this nothing of import happened to our hero he prosecuted his law studies with the same success with which he had done those of college winning opinions from mr la haise as favourable as those he had previously done from his professors his life though regular and quiet was by no means dull or lonely and he was often invited out in families occupying a high social position where the presence of refined accomplished women formed an atmosphere most attractive to him despite his timidity to mr de courval's notwithstanding that he was pressingly invited by the latter he rarely went for though gertrude was kind and polite mrs de beauvoir's reception of him was so frigid that inexperienced as he was in feminine ways he could not mistake her hostile feelings towards him on the few occasions that he encountered de montenay the latter made no advances and his reserve was faithfully copied by armand a cold nod when they met being the only remaining token of what had once been a warm friendship belfond often dropped in to see him occasionally bringing a friend as light-hearted as himself armand never offered them any other refreshments than canadian tobacco for it must be acknowledged that all these young men smoked and a glass of cider or ale with occasionally a plate of rosy fameuse apples or crisp crullers dainties constantly sent him from home by his aunt Rattel and belfond accustomed as he was to a table spread with every luxury enjoyed these impromptu feasts with a zest equal to any he had displayed in his hungry college days one evening that he had brought with him a gentlemanly young fellow a law student and that all three were discussing amid puffs of narcotic smoke the politics of the day condemning the tyranny of the imperial government and the blindness of their own rulers and settling the affairs of europe with wonderful celerity if not wisdom a visitor for mr durand was announced and looming large in the small room paul made his appearance of course there was a cordial exchange of civilities a rapid fire of questions and answers about home the country the roads and then the newcomer was provided with a pipe and smoking recommenced with vigour but the conversation did not flow as freely as before paul's mind was of a stamp far inferior to that of his companions and this difference was rendered still more marked by a certain rusticity of manner and language which he had actually been at some pains to acquire when he had settled down at alonville on leaving college as this gradually became more evident to him he grew taciturn and listened with a sort of moody preoccupation to the keen polished sallies the witty retorts of his companions varying the occupation by stealthily contrasting their white slender hands with his own embrowned ones and their easy graceful motions with his own stiff constrained movements at length the other guests took leave and the brothers were left alone eh bien ejaculated paul you are not so much to be pitied as i once thought you were the entre you are very comfortable here and quite the fine gentleman without noticing the ugly sneer with which the latter words were uttered armand rejoined you forget that i am shut up during a great part of the day in a dingy office dungeon to use your own words 
a dungeon that perhaps you see very little of retorted paul when a fellow hates a place he can easily keep away from it but paul i do no such thing earnestly answered the other i do not shirk my law studies any more than i did my college ones oh you needn't begin bragging about them now i'm sure we have all heard enough of the subject between my father and la tante francoise i have had a perfect sickening of it but to change the topic here is a letter from father with something better than mere words of advice in it as i guessed he added on armand's opening the epistle and finding a couple of banknotes inside whilst the latter perused his letter smilingly dwelling on the pleasant words of affection it contained paul lay moodily back in his chair watching the unconscious reader with a lowering brow he silently compared the rough unfashionable cut and texture of his own homespun suit which he had ordered so complacently from the village tailor with the plain but well-made clothes armand wore his well-trained well-brushed glossy hair with his own rough uncared-for locks and the little signs of refinement on the simple dressing-table which whilst he sneered at them excited nevertheless his vexation the sad truth was that the spirit of unworthy jealousy which had for years past smouldered in paul's breast towards his elder brother was beginning to assume a more definite character and was developing itself under the new tide of reflections and thoughts flowing in upon him with startling rapidity the constant flattering mention of armand at home from a father and aunt both exceedingly proud of his talents the frequent remittances sent him though in this respect paul had no cause for jealousy for durand was strictly impartial in all pecuniary matters and lastly the wide difference he now plainly saw for the first time not only between himself and his refined gentleman brother but also that brother's associates fanned the feeling of envy into active life paul what are you thinking of questioned armand as he folded up his letter and placed it and the enclosure in his stout leather pocket-book of how easily you win your daily bread well all things have a beginning you know of course i can make nothing now but when i shall have passed my examination and fairly entered the field matters will be wonderfully different words are cheap said paul grimly and so are sneers though they are not the more agreeable for that retorted the other beginning to feel nettled at his companion's persistent ill-humour oh you must overlook the plain speaking or boorishness as i suppose you would call it of a rough farmer like myself was paul's ironical reply i have not the advantages of town polish what are you driving at paul speak out your thoughts like a man can't you well it is this here are you dressed en grand seigneur waited on like one entertaining the aristocracy receiving money i suppose when you choose to ask for it and what do you do for all this i on the other hand with no such pretensions or expenses am up every morning before five tramping over the farm in all weathers and roads out drudging working under burning sun or chilling rain your own choice so you need not quarrel with it how decidedly did you proclaim on your last return from college that you would be no bookworm no galley slave chained to a musty desk but would choose a farmer's free independent life father would willingly have given you a profession if you had asked him no one of that calling in a family is quite enough there must be some one to look after the bread and butter of the others or they might come to no hunger pooh pooh brother paul answered armand with a good-humoured laugh through which however pierced a shade of annoyance our father can do all that for years to come as he has done it in the past be honest now as you were in the old college days when you used to tell us you would rather be a farmer tramping in heavy boots through muddy fields and ditches than the governor in his chair of state oh bother was the illogical reply 
tisn't fair to cast up in a fellow's face things he may happen to have said years ago but paul it is not too late yet to retract your choice on your return speak to father i know you will soon gain him round to your wishes and before two months from this you can be settled down law or medical student whichever suits you best and share my room here which seems to have so highly excited your grumbling admiration there's no particular hurry in the case that i know of was the dry rejoinder besides sending monthly remittances to two might require a little study of ways and means on father's part first let us leave the subject then before we quarrel over it i will go and ask mrs martel if she can spare me a pillow and blankets to-night and you can turn into my bed no i must go back to the three kings where i've left my horse if you offer me supper though i won't refuse it willingly that was included in my offer of a bed armand then went to inform his landlady of the unexpected addition to the supper-table and having received her friendly assurance of satisfaction thereat returned to paul who beginning to feel ashamed of his late querulous ill-humour made an effort to be somewhat more agreeable Glimat Lorrain was at supper and the new guest seemed almost as much struck with her beauty as belfond had been he was very civil in his own abrupt way offering this proffering that and on the return of the brothers to the bedroom he fairly overwhelmed armand with questions as to who she was whence she had come how long she would stay plain jokes and hints as to such charms being enough to reconcile a man to dungeons darker than law offices and allusions to the complete silence armand had maintained on the very existence of a person who without doubt gave occupation enough to his thoughts proved still more unpalatable to the young host than the cross-questioning had done and at length he said do for mercy's sake try for another subject a little more amusing than one that bores me so immensely i heartily wish little delima were back in st laurent again for she brings down on my devoted head an insufferable amount of poor jokes and wearisome questions inwardly setting down this speech as meaning the reverse of what armand really felt especially as the latter owing to some chance remembrance of gertrude de beauvoir had coloured two or three times during the conversation paul abandoned the subject and found one more satisfactory to his companion in recounting the changes that had taken place of late in alonville who constituted the village choir who had been appointed church warden inspector of roads and other offices it was rather late when the brothers separated for the night but though paul's rest was generally profound and sleep a visitor that came with little solicitation it was long that night before slumber closed his lids and he tossed and tumbled on his couch alternating between jealous feelings towards his brother and half regrets that his own peculiar tastes and temperament would prevent him following the profession of a gentleman hang it no he muttered with an impatient plunge on his pillow nature neither made nor intended me for a smirking town fop so let me be off with the dawn i hate this place End of chapter 9chapter ten of armand durand by rosanna le proan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary after stopping a moment in front of mr martel's door the following morning to say a word of farewell to his brother paul jolted homeward the train of his thoughts more or less tinged with his reflections of the previous night arrived at the old homestead he was besieged with questions as to how he had found armand how he was looking and what he was doing and alas for human nature he contrived whilst keeping to a certain degree within the bounds of truth to answer in such a manner as to show his brother and his surroundings in the least favourable light he was smoking chatting with a couple of fine gentlemen friends who from their talk must be frequent visitors of his 
he was dressed in the height of the fashion looking exceedingly gay and not at all like one who studied too hard or worried his mind unnecessarily with professional problems the father looked somewhat grave at this for he thought of the many temptations into which ill-chosen companions might lead his inexperienced son but mrs ratelle was quite satisfied that he should rank with gentlemen dress look like them for after all he would be one of them there was no saying what high social position he was destined to fill bah sneered paul perhaps to spend his life haunting the courthouse looking always to my father to pay for the very kid gloves with which he covers his dainty hands son paul be not so ready to find fault with your elder brother he has as yet given me no cause for mistrust or uneasiness said durand no all the other way interrupted mrs ratelle glancing indignantly towards her nephew who carried off the highest honours at college who was publicly praised by his professors for industry and good conduct paul durand can it be that you are jealous of your elder brother oh misericorde ejaculated paul i give in i retract i apologize anything you wish tante francoise so you will let us have peace father for mercy's sake lend me a pipe and a little tobacco mrs ratelle made no reply to this speech but the warlike defiant manner in which her knitting needles clashed together plainly betrayed that her ruffled feelings were still unsoothed meanwhile that subtle enchantress delima lorrain was quietly endeavouring all the time to weave her spells around our hero and he at last began to discern and appreciate in some degree her beauty and grace after his attention had been as it were forcibly attracted towards them by the praise and wonderment of all his friends who had seen her to these latter she was very distant indeed cold and never answered by smile or encouraging word to any of the compliments that were gallantly whispered to her by passing admirers but for armand there was always a soft blush a timid look or gentle inflection in her voice that plainly betrayed she took a deep interest in him gradually a friendly intimacy was springing up between them chiefly the result of their residence under the same roof often in the long evenings of winter which had now come on them he spent a couple of hours in the family sitting-room reading aloud or perhaps playing a game of draughts with de lima who was no mean adversary had he been less inexperienced in life or more suspicious in temperament he could not have helped noticing the remarkable dexterity with which mrs martel contrived to farther the growing friendship between himself and her pretty young cousin pressing mr armand on stormy snowy nights when there was little fear of interruption to leave his lonely room for a little while and join their circle of which delima always occupied with her sewing formed a member then she would compassionately bid the latter put down that work at which she was eternally stitch stitching and perhaps mr armand would kindly play a game of draughts with her very frequently too mrs martel was obliged to absent herself in the course of the evening to look as she alleged after household duties but the grave propriety of the young people during these frequent hegiras was irreproachable and must if that astute matron was watching them from some hidden corner have highly edified her during the winter armand studied closely enough going out however to social gatherings occasionally and indulging in no more expensive dissipation than was comprised in an occasional oyster supper partaken of with his student friends the number of caraquettes sacrificed during these harmless revels was so considerable that it would be hardihood to state it on paper lest the sum total should be looked on as an exaggeration one keen wintry afternoon as armand was hanging up his overcoat having just returned from the office an old college chum for whom he had never felt any particular friendship but who had nevertheless persisted in keeping up the acquaintance called to invite him to an oyster banquet 
my address he jocosely added is a small wooden house st mary street up three flights of steps first door opening on the garret now armand partly expected his brother on that particular evening from the contents of a letter received the preceding day but as it had snowed heavily for some time he began to think the fear of heavy roads would have induced him to defer his journey at least such was the view taken of the matter by robert l'esperance when armand pleaded his brother's expected arrival as an excuse for declining the invitation feeling in reality no great desire to join the set he would meet the members of which were probably of a much faster stamp than he was himself but l'esperance begged insisted adroitly hinting that of course durand was accustomed to wealthier and more aristocratic entertainments till armand out of good nature finally yielded a reluctant consent when our hero sallied forth first leaving precise directions where he could be found in case of paul's arrival it was considerably past the appointed hour but he had wished to give his brother every possible chance l'esperance's jocular description of his abode was pretty near the truth and armand's head nearly came in contact with the low-browed door on entering the noise that saluted his ears was deafening long loud bursts of laughter occasional snatches of song convivial cheers and an occasional sound as of a double shuffle executed by heavy boots on a bare floor betokened that mirth even at this early stage of the proceedings reigned triumphant there was but a momentary lull on armand's entrance during which he excused his late arrival and the host accounted for the uproar by explaining that in order to prevent his guests falling on the bivalves and incontinently causing their complete disappearance before mr durand's arrival he had challenged them to see if they could not get up a little merriment without any extraneous aid in the shape of refreshments liquid or solid the result had proved satisfactory enough to excite a natural anxiety in any reflecting mind as to what height the general joviality would attain when stimulated by the banquet which l'esperance with one of his friends was now occupied in preparing the apartment in which armand found himself was very different to his own neatly furnished exquisitely clean room of small size low with ceiling and woodwork discoloured by time and smoke there was no attempt at ornament except a few rude coloured prints of lady dancers with preternaturally pink cheeks and short full skirts side by side with a likeness of a noted boxer and some famous french clown in one corner was a large painted chest containing the host's wardrobe and answering also as a library being piled with dusty venerable-looking volumes in another a fishing-rod and pair of rusty foils or arched a cracked mirror suspended against the wall and so small that l'esperance frequently declared he could only see his features in detail one at a time a pair of snowshoes placed at angles ornamented one window whilst a toboggan partly blocked up the other a clean though rough table probably borrowed for the occasion from downstairs filled up a great part of the chamber some black bottles containing liquids stronger than montreal ale flanked each end a few coarse towels a lame cruet stand two empty pails on the floor to receive the shells and all was complete we must not overlook the great variety displayed in the matter of drinking vessels a few common tumblers two blue delf mugs and three teacups presented variety if not elegance suddenly the host assuming a grave expression of countenance exclaimed and now gentlemen for an important question washed or not washed not washed of course shouted several voices let them come on the board with their native mud around them so much the better for my amiable landlady beside whom gorgon and medusa would have been agreeable and charming informed me a short while ago that i should have to wash them myself 
here friend pierre as your mouth is always open either singing or shouting you will probably swallow the most so help me to carry them in no sooner said than done from some gloomy nook outside probably the garret the pair soon reappeared bearing between them a huge tray piled high with dainty caraquettes now friends to the attack i have but two legitimate weapons of warfare and he flourished above his head two dingy oyster knives one of which i reserve for myself as lord of the manor the other for monsieur durand as the latest accession to our select and cheerful circle there are several dinner knives a screwdriver no bad substitute i assure you if well sharpened and a jack-knife so choose gentlemen choose unless some of you have come ready armed probably foreseeing from experience a similar contingency a couple of the guests actually drew oyster knives from their pockets whilst others had good stout jack knives almost equally serviceable and the onset commenced after some time the door opened and a sharp-featured grim-looking specimen of the softer sex entered bearing a large jug of steaming water in her hand ah many thanks la mere heartily ejaculated l'esperance now whoever wants punch can have it but see dear madame Urteau, if you could possibly lend us a couple of tumblers instead of these teacups no matter how hot or strong we make the beverage we cannot for the life of us help thinking tis tea we are drinking all the time the consequence is we take occasionally too much that you would always do in any case and she sourly smiled yourself and friends cracked two glasses the last orgy you held here and you have not paid me for them yet though i intend you shall do so when settling for the month's rent yes my dear lady and it shall be done even if i have to raise the necessary funds by public subscription he rejoined with imperturbable good humour if madame can wait a moment we shall send round the hat at once gravely urged an undersized merry-looking youth who had already with no better implement than a rusty table-knife accumulated a fair pile of shells before him then it's precious little you'd put in it georges le roi was the retort accompanied by a look of withering scorn tis always the worst wheel of the cart that creaks the loudest your quotation is old and stale madame Otto try again and strike out something original and new disdaining farther reply the hostess retreated slamming the door behind her with a violence that made the caraquettes shake in their shells and the ballet girls on the walls over the scene we will not linger much longer for a time there was really some very excellent singing glees duets with a full effective chorus but as the cracked tumblers and mugs more frequently circulated the organs of time and tune in most of the singers seemed to become singularly obtuse and the result was highly distressing to a critical ear indeed the mirth was becoming every moment more noisy and uproarious the oysters having been disposed of and the shells pushed into a corner a couple of the guests were executing a pas de deux in the middle of them whistling their own accompaniment another had climbed on the table and was shouting at the top of his stentorian lungs some pathetic sentimental ballad whilst the hum of voices ringing of glasses and peals of laughter filled up the measure of noise in the midst of this turmoil the landlady flung open the door gruffly exclaiming you'll find him in there young man and paul durand was ushered into the room at first he could scarcely see or be seen through the dense clouds of tobacco smoke filling the apartment but in a moment his hand was grasped in armand's the singer descended from his impromptu orchestra and the dancers now thoroughly out of breath sat down regrets were expressed over the entire disappearance of the oysters but the black bottles still contained what their host called some drops of comfort with which pole was at once provided as well as with a well-filled pipe perceiving the uproar was again recommencing more furiously than ever 
armand begged leave to retire with the newcomer as they had much to say to each other and after noisy good-nights and farewells the brothers descended the stairs and set off under a bright moonlight sky the glittering white snow crackling pleasantly beneath their feet you seem to have got into a pretty lively set said paul dryly tis my first evening among them and i do not think i'll be in a hurry to try a second one for i could not stand much of such noisy enjoyment my head is aching already Fah, no wonder coughed paul such a miserable dirty den i wonder what tante francoise with her aristocratic leanings would say could she have had a peep in there to-night another sort of gentry to the white-handed witty young dandies i found you with last time i must confess the latter are far more to my taste but how are they all at home father is not well confined to his bed by rheumatism and rather low-spirited aunt francoise is busy coddling and nursing him and i general administrator of the farm business tis well i am not tied to a town office just now or affairs would not go on as smoothly as they do armand readily coincided in this opinion and when they were comfortably seated beside the brightly polished stove in the best parlour of the three kings he took the letter paul handed him and entered on its perusal it was much briefer than such home missives generally were and there was an unusual querulousness in the hopes it contained that armand was endeavouring to profit of his time and of the money he was costing glancing also at the great services paul rendered them at home and thanking providence he was with them whatever was unusual about this epistle armand sat down to the physical suffering under which the writer was labouring and he and his brother talked more earnestly and quietly than was their wont of home affairs and family matters End of chapter ten